Easter Island is the most remote inhabited island on Earth. It's way out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, more than 2,000 miles from the shores of South America, and over 1,000 miles from the nearest island. It's a miracle anyone found this tiny volcanic piece of land at all, but they did. Sometime between 900 and 1100 AD, a small daring group of Polynesian explorers journeyed across the ocean and made it their home. Their culture flourished until it didn't. This is the story of Rapa Nui. It's one of collapse and genocide, incredible megalithic art, and perhaps a fundamental misunderstanding of human nature. What's in a name? Nobody knows the original name of Easter Island, not even the native inhabitants still living there. Perhaps this is a testament to the scale of collapse that took place. Jakob Brogevin, the Dutch explorer who was the first European to touch its shores, dubbed it Easter Island, after miraculously spotting it on Easter Sunday in 1722. Today, it's known in Polynesia as Rapa Nui. However, this name was only coined in the 1860s after the culture's near total collapse. Some say the original name was Te Pito, which translates to either the navel of the world or the end of the earth. Others say there was no specific original name. It was simply called Te Kanga, which means Earth. The island was so remote, perhaps its early inhabitants knew of nowhere else. The Maui, Guardians of Easter Island Mythical, massive, and mysterious, the Moai megaliths dotting the landscape of Rapa Nui are marvels of ancient stonework. Nearly a thousand of these carved figures once stood, serene and godlike, throughout the island. Many now lie neck deep in soil, but excavations have revealed that they do indeed have bodies, complete with arms and torsos that once rested on platforms called Ahu. The Maui are said to be representations of deified ancestors that guarded over the land and its people. Some are nearly 30 feet tall and weigh more than 80 tons. The largest, named Palo, weighs 82 tons and stands at an imposing 32 feet. Most of the statues were carved from tough and easy-to-carve volcanic stone quarried from a single site on the island, though only about half of the Maui were actually installed in their final locations. The rest remained at the quarry, some unfinished, some just unmoved. Was this a sign that the Rapa Nui culture collapsed mid-chisel? Maybe. However, experts now think that the Rapa Nui people may have kept these leftover figures there intentionally to watch over the site. We're also not sure just how exactly the Rapa Nui were able to move these massive megaliths. One theory suggests they hauled them on Y-shaped sleds made of tree trunks using ropes made of tree bark. This method would have required upwards of 200 people to move each statue, no small feat. But another more recent theory suggests that they were moved using a rocking technique that could have been managed by just 15 people using ropes. Such a method would make the statues appear as though they were walking, which fits with a local legend that says the Moai walked to their final locations. Hoa Hakanana'a and Omens of Doom One of the most impressive Moai is a statue called Hoa Hakanana'a. It is one of the few statues carved from basalt instead of tuff. Basalt is one of the hardest rocks around. It is difficult to carve even with iron or steel tools, which the Rapa Nui people didn't have. Experts say the Moai were carved using basalt picks called toki, which have been found throughout Easter Island. To create Hoa Hakananai'a though, basalt tools wouldn't cut it. They probably had to use an abrasive technique to grind and smooth the hard stone, an incredibly intensive effort. Carved into the back of Hoa Hakananai'a are images of anthropomorphic birdmen, cut out at some later date after the original statue had been finished. The carvings seem at odds with the elegance of the smooth, sharp lines of the original statue. Why were they added? What do they mean? And why, by 1877, were most of the Maui guardians on Easter Island toppled and abandoned? with just 110 people left struggling for survival in the shattered remains of a once great culture. Collapse The original theory on the collapse of Rapa Nui society was first put forward by the archaeologist William Malloy in the 1970s. It was made famous by Jared Diamond's best-selling book, Collapse, published in 2005. The story goes like this. 
Long before Europeans ever arrived on Rapa Nui, society had devolved into civil war. Thousands died, cannibalism was rampant, warring factions were fighting for the few remaining resources on the island. Archaeological discoveries of hundreds of obsidian spear points and human skeletal remains seem to back this up. The reason for the collapse? The Rapa Nui people had cut down nearly all the trees on their island. Their quest to build the Moai and an irresponsible use of slash and burn agriculture were the culprits. What was once a lush fertile landscape filled with more than 16 million trees when the settlers first rode there to shore had turned into a barren wasteland by the time Europeans first arrived in the 1700s. When the famed explorer Captain James Cook visited the island in 1774, he described the natives as weak, timid, and miserable. In his book Collapse, Jared Diamond uses this account as part of the proof that Easter Island had experienced an ecocide, a massive societal collapse due to the destruction of nature. Diamond warns that the horrible events that unfolded on this tiny isolated island could be a microcosm of what could happen around the world if we can't figure out how to use Earth's resources more responsibly. It's a story of an isolated collapse and a rather pessimistic view of human nature that assumes we are quick to devolve into chaos and warfare when things go wrong. A different story. Except it isn't. There's another version of the story. One that offers a more positive view of human nature and highlights our ability to persevere and work together when times are tough. However, in the end, it's no less horrible than the first story. It goes like this. People didn't destroy the forests of Easter Island. Rats did. Polynesian rats to be specific. Stowaways on the first settlers' canoes, the rats quickly multiplied into the millions and became an invasive species. They feasted on palm tree roots and seeds, setting in motion a flurry of ecological mayhem that led to the extinction of many other plants and animals on the island. But society didn't collapse. The people of Rapa Nui adapted. Evidence from ancient garbage heaps showed that 60% of the refuse was rat bones, suggesting the invasive species became a source of food. Also, a creative farming technique called rock gardening allowed the islanders to maintain fertile soil to grow crops. Scattering broken stones in the dirt allowed the wind to release mineral nutrients from the rock and fertilize the soil. And Captain Cook's account of the natives as weak, timid, and miserable? He never wrote or said that. In fact, he described them as vibrant and healthy. Other visitors to Easter Island in the 1700s and 1800s said the same. A French explorer who visited the island in 1786 wrote, Instead of meeting with men exhausted by famine, I found on the contrary a considerable population, with more beauty and grace than I afterwards met in any other island, and a soil which, with very little labor, furnished excellent provisions and in an abundance more than sufficient for the consumption of the inhabitants. So, it seems Easter Island did not devolve into warfare and cannibalism. Those obsidian spear points mentioned earlier were not weapons, but rather tools for preparing food. Scientists in 2016 determined they were too dull for warfare, and very few of the skeletons unearthed actually showed signs of physical injury. Also, the rocking technique for moving the Maui wouldn't have required cutting down any trees, just a few people and some rope. There is also evidence that the Rapa Nui people continued making art well after the deforestation of their island. In 2020, scientists discovered large pits once filled with red pigment that date to between 1200 and 1650 AD. The red pigment is called ochre, and the natives used it for painting the Maui and making petroglyphs. The Birdman Cult Rapa Nui had to adapt and change as the rats ate their trees. Maybe their society didn't totally collapse due to the deforestation, but it certainly wasn't a walk in the park. At some point, they abandoned their megalithic carving and a new religious system began to develop. By 1540, the Birdman Cult had emerged on the southwestern tip of the island. The cult worshipped the god Make Make, creator of humanity and the god of fertility, as well as Hawatu Taketake, the chief of the eggs. 
On the summit of the Ranu Cal Volcano Caldera, pictographs and carvings of 375 birdmen, or Tangata Manu, have been found painted or etched into rocks. They were also carved into the Moai. Remember Hoa Hakananaya? The birdmen carved into his back provides a singular artifact showing this transition from Moai culture to birdman culture. In 1680, the village of Orongo was founded, and over 50 stone houses were built. New traditions emerged. Each year, a new leader would be appointed through a competition in order to maintain a peaceful transition of power. Participants would dive down the dangerous cliffs of Orongo and swim to a small inlet to find the first egg of a bird called the Manutara, then bring it back to the village. The winner would be the supreme ruler for the year until the next competition. The new leader would even shave his head and grow his nails long in order to look more like a bird. It was a more or less healthy society with the capacity to create art, a peaceful organizational structure, and an established belief system. But then, the Europeans came. Cargo Cults and Genocide It was European contact that led to the final, devastating collapse of Rapa Nui society. The arrival of Dutch explorer Jakob Roggeveen in 1722 was a shock to the islanders, who up until then thought they were the only people on Earth. They began constructing stone models of European ships, and, and experts believe the world's first cargo cult emerged. But the Europeans also brought diseases that ravaged the population throughout the 1800s. And then in 1862, the first slave ships arrived. Peruvian slavers carried away more than 1,400 people, a third of the population on the island. The next year, after pressure from the international community, the Peruvian government returned the few who had survived. 470 were loaded on a ship bound for Easter Island, but smallpox killed most of them, and only 15 made it back. It may have been better if those 15 hadn't made it back, though, because smallpox exploded through the remaining population on the island. By 1877, just 110 people were still alive. The story of Easter Island is a cautionary tale, just not the one we used to think it was. Who knows what would have happened on the island had European explorers never found it? Maybe the islanders would have maintained their simple, peaceful way of life in harmony with the land. Maybe they would have invented new technologies, regrown the forests, and developed a more complex civilization. Maybe they were experiencing a long descent doomed to run out of resources. We will never know.